So welcome, welcome to uh, our third community program. I'm going to be talking today about emotions and the body, uh, and in particular how it interacts with the subconscious brain, the, the part of the brain that you don't actually control. And I thought this was quite a nice diagram because it kind of shows the, the energy in different parts of the body when you're feeling different emotions. You've heard of people being hot headed with anger. Well, I think this uh, perfectly demonstrates it. This first image here is anger. Um, if we contrast that perhaps with sadness, you'll see that there's a lot less energy in the peripheral parts of the body, the legs and arms. Um, a neutral, which is to the right here on this top layer, you know, it's just fairly cool, pretty everywhere. Uh, love, look at love on the second row here. Um, full of energy throughout the torso, you know, the, the center of the body. And there are a few others as well, which kind of show a, a marked difference in kind of energy radiance. And so I introduced this subject last time that, that emotions are a form of energy. They're not just a feeling. They actually have a physical correlate in the body and they're energy in motion, but they're not all the same. Um, they are the currency of our mind-body control system, otherwise known as the autonomic nervous system, which is linked to our emotional brains, uh, the limbic system in particular. And this therefore distributes the, the physiological component of that emotion to the rest of our body. And so any symptoms that we are feeling in our bodies are actually part of the emotional landscape and we should see them as the messenger and not the problem although many of us do we fear our symptoms and we fear our pain of course but knowing that actually emotions are there to be felt or experienced in an emotionally safe environment is the key takeaway really that the emotional safety is such an important part of what makes emotions move through the body and unprocessed emotions otherwise known as trauma is such a common experience it's almost true to say that there's nobody who doesn't have some and it, it can show up in surprising ways it can show up as pain or fatigue that doesn't get better with rest and that differentiates it from mere tiredness or or acute pain mood swings um, anxiety or depression we can get huge effects from from those kinds of symptoms as well and inattention uh, or you know adhd like symptoms which make our brain kind of work in peculiar ways and we can't focus and some people describe that as a sort of brain fog um, it's actually a very low energy state and most of these symptoms defy current medical explanation, not because we, we don't know this stuff, but because the medical system has no model with which to track this. And what it can't measure, it, it struggles with. And what it can't uh, monetize, it struggles with. And you can't monetize emotions, at least not yet. Never rule that out. I thought uh, we'd look a little bit about why emotions and pain are linked because I haven't covered this before. Uh, it is in my book, but I thought I wanted to just talk about this a little bit because it's modern medicine struggles a lot with the idea that that pain could have a have an emotional origin. But you see, pain is a very interesting thing. It's, it's actually formed in the brain. And we sometimes refer to that as the pain brain. And we know that certain emotions, particularly anger, fear, and guilt, or shame, bury themselves in the body um, in particular ways, and that fatigue, anxiety, or pain are often the physical symptoms that we get from those experiences. And the interesting thing is that this, this kind of pain, if you do get chronic pain, is independent of injury or inflammation. All right, so it may not show up on tests. You do the tests or you go to the doctor or the consultant, you have tests after test after test, and they show nothing wrong. There is no tissue damage and there's very little evidence of inflammatory um, markers. 
but you're still having this terrible pain in different parts of your body. And so how can we explain that? It's very difficult um, if you don't have this kind of mind body understanding. Now you'll see from the diagram that the, the emotional brain, which is the limbic system, which is all these bits really marked in yellow here, um, we wouldn't include the thalamus in that because that's kind of a central processing station. Um, but, but it does have a great deal of influence on pain because it, it kind of processes the, the material, the neural impulses and decides whether it's important or not. But you'll see the areas where um, pain is kind of monitored and uh, dealt with. And it's very close to the part of the brain that actually is linked to the physical pain networks. And I've ringed that here. That's the back brain or brain stem and the cerebellum, which is this tiny little hanging part uh, on the lower part of the left hand side there. And that is where pain is kind of modulated because, of course, it links to your spinal cord where pain is transferred along the spinal nerves. And so you'll see these areas are very, very, um, particularly the hippocampus, which, of course, is related to memory. And the amygdala, which is your kind of fear center or smoke alarm, which detects whether something is threatening or not. You see how close they are to the pain centers. And so really we can think of um, pain that does not get better with time as a form of crossed wires in the brain. And somebody, actually Daniel Claw has, he's, he's done a brilliant presentation on this and he likens it to the amplifier volume control being turned way too high, you know? So everything that comes in, the all inputs are perceived as pain, even if they're not intrinsically painful. And so imagine having your, your volume knob turned up far too high. Um, that's how it feels when you have chronic pain. Everything is painful and little, little things make a big difference. And, and what's interesting about these pathways is that they're actually learned they are learned from past experience and so it's not intrinsic to the human being that they have um, crossed wires crossed wires this happens often through past experience kind of sensitizing us and we get we get a fixed on state um, where past emotions aren't processed and particularly if your current state is lonely, isolated or lacking meaning, which often this is a terrible cycle we fall into when we get ill because, you know, it's a very isolating condition getting chronic fatigue. Um, of course, that is becoming more well known now as, as we're getting long COVID and people are starting to understand it a little bit better. But this this problem is exacerbated then by your current situation and especially so if you are already emotionally sensitive you're a highly sensitive person i talked about that before so you've got you've got a perfect storm of conditions really you've got um, the brain structure which is kind of set up to interact with other parts of the brain um, so pain pathways and your emotional processing are very very close and then you've got You've got past experience, which teaches the brain what to expect and creates learned neural pathways. And then you've got triggers in the current life, which exacerbate and build these pain states. And um, if you want more information on that, uh, look at the scar that won't heal, which is my, the book I wrote about it. Or uh, there's a fabulous talk, if you prefer video, um, on, I think it's called chronic pain, um, something, uh, sen central sensitization by Daniel Claw. And, and do note his surname. I'll, I'll put the link um, in the chat, but his surname is spelt C L A U W. So if you want to look that up, it's, it's about an hour and 20 minutes, but it's a really, really accessible talk on, on how he believes pain is created, chronic pain is created. And so the interesting thing about this then is that there's no such thing as a pain signal that is distinguished from any other signal. Pain is entirely a perception of your unconscious brain. 
it's really only a neural signal. That's all it is. And then the brain makes the interpretation as it does with vision, for instance, or hearing. Um, it makes the interpretation as to what it is perceiving. And so it's true to say that all pain really is in the brain, not in the tissue. It's, it's the signal is fired from the tissue, but the brain is the one that makes the final call on whether it's painful or not. And of course, this is all unconscious. So it's, it's a, a part of the brain that um, doesn't actually have conscious awareness. And so it's all going on behind the scenes without your knowing about it. So you may have these unconscious or unprocessed emotions, but you won't necessarily know. And um, the other important point to stress here is that emotional injury, someone hurts you emotionally, activates the same parts of the brain as physical pain. All right, and we did not know this uh, until probably um, functional MRI, which is the, the way that um, we now can see what's going on in the brains of living people. Previously, we had to dissect dead brains to work out the, the structural components, but now we can see what's happening in living brains. We actually can see which bits light up and which don't. And so Daniel Claw's talk actually um, uh, discusses this a little bit, as does Howard Schubiner's Unlearn Your Pain, which is another really good recommendation if you want more information on this. Um, so we have to learn somehow, we have to unlearn the pain process and we have to get unstuck from these certain neural pathways, these kind of fixed neural pathways that have become amplified. And therefore, I believe one of the best ways of doing that is to take out the unprocessed memories of the past, which are unconsciously activating your danger alarm mechanism. So they're creating a state where you feel permanently under threat. And to replace that with a feeling of emotional safety, which you may never have had. We've had lots of discussions, um, haven't we, on this um, program, but also in other programs that I've run about what emotional safety feels like, because some people have never really experienced it. And they may have had, um, you know, parental control or uh, instability or, or experiences that were utterly uh, without certainty. And so they learned perhaps that it was not safe to feel. Um, so it's worth stressing though, that if the unconscious parts of your brain that create are, are the ones that create the pain, then it must be possible um, to use parts of the brain to unlearn that pain. In other words, we need to activate your unconscious learning processes. And so we have to use the power of the unconscious brain rather than just talking about what's going on for you. Now, I alluded to this last week, but I wanted to just show you this lovely diagram about emotional resilience and how it relates to past experience. So, um, we need to feel emotions in a safe environment to be able to process them and learn this experience of emotional resilience, which is this lovely blue wiggly line here that sort of goes up and down and up and down, but in a very nice steady way from calm through to excited or assertive. But you probably know already that most of us who've had kind of these past experiences where it wasn't safe to feel our responses uh, don't look like this at all. We tend to veer from the bottom le level, which is kind of hopeless and depressed, up into hyperarousal, which is usually anxious and uh, irritable. We need to learn then that we can both feel things and then be okay. In other words, we can learn to process an emotion without being overwhelmed by it. Overwhelm is the absolute marker of trauma. It, it, it's not having emotions that create trauma, it's being overwhelmed by those emotions. And so we need to learn, our nervous systems need to actively learn that they can bounce between these states in a nice fluid kind of, um, you know, gentle variability, a nice smooth curve. And if as children we did not learn this, particularly if we did not see it, in the 
uh, models, the role models we had, we actually learn to uh, avoid our, our pain and we learn actually not to modulate or be resilient to our feelings. And so we become sensitized to this emotional pain that we're experiencing. And then the end result is that we live in a state of sympathetic fight and flight. So sympathetic is that arm of your nervous system that's uh, hyper arousal, sort of red zone here. Uh, or you may end up living in a parasympathetic freeze state, um, which is the blue zone down here. And so these become rather fixed. And although you can veer between one and the other, you'll tend to have a level at which you, you know, habitually live. And our, our brain learns to over interpret social cues as danger, you know, as dangerous. And we become trained for pain. Now, I had a conversation with someone in the week, actually, who'd been working in the National Health Service um, and had been subject to a lot of abuse recently during the, the, the COVID crisis, because um, obviously they're all under stress. People are desperate. Um, and she was a frontline staff member and, and she'd had a lot of abuse from the public. And she'd actually been off work with stress for that because she found it so hard to modulate her nervous system and come back down into a state of calm. And, and, you know, I told her, this isn't your fault. This is the way your nervous system has been trained. And, and it was such a relief for her to hear that. She, she actually burst into tears because I think she felt it was something to do with her, that, that it was her fault and that she could somehow make a decision not to take things as seriously as she, she obviously does. But it's not like that. Sensitivity isn't isn't something you decide to be um, or have it's it's a natural response and so as a summary then children who grew up feeling unsafe emotionally are sensitized to being triggered in later life by similar feelings just as that lady was so someone being abusive or angry with her triggered her a nervous system risk to respond in ways that her nervous system learned to respond in her sort of family of origin as she grew up and pain can be the end result i mean pain of one sort or another but it is possible to unlearn these signals and social or interpersonal support is so key and this is why i launched this program and this membership and um, why i'm trying to get this information out there because i want all of us to understand the role we have for each other in providing uh, a safe haven. We are, you see, very interpersonal creatures. We're, we're wired to connect energetically with each other. And, and that's not just a sort of woo woo idea. It's actually we have something called mirror neurons in our brain and we have information processing centers that actually mirror what's going on in the emotional state of the people that we are connected with and so if someone is angry we will get triggered by that if somebody is happy and loving towards us we will mirror that in in our brains too and we we need to learn to be able to think and feel at the same time now usually what happens we've got two strategies of coping as i've told you maybe before but some people go into the thinking strategy and they become very cerebral and intellectual um, and they're not really connected with their emotions. And some people go the opposite way and they're just all emotion and their brain gets completely hijacked to think rationally. And so they just feel far too much. And what we want is a nice balance between those two things. And I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about that in the next session. We actually need our brains to be integrated and integration means both the left and the right talking to each other, but also the front and the back, you know, because you've got you've got your thinking brain at the front and then you've got your more uh, survival based structures at the back. And of course, don't forget the heart as well. The heart talks to the brain, the brain talks to the heart. You've got a lot of neural integration there. Depression is considered a disease by modern medicine, but it's probably more accurate to say it's an imbalance. It's an imbalance in neurotransmitters, usually where our emotional needs are not met. Um, and it's not actually something wrong in a way. It's something 
logical when your brain is perceiving that you are alone with your problem. And so the antidote to that is to experience connection and meaning and allow the brain to reintegrate and rebalance. And that's what I'm trying to engender here with our, our course and um, our community program. Um, I'm going to be talking next time about uh, right brain, left brain and what, where empathy resides, because I think we need to know where empathy and sensitivity, emotional sensitivity tend to come from, because they, they do have specific parts of the brain that they relate to. Um, so I'll be covering that in more detail. I've said next week, but I actually mean next session. <laughs> and um, the learnings from today, then, just a quick summary before we come to maybe share your thoughts or feelings about this. And something um, you might wish to think about is what experiences did you have that might have sensitized you? You know, I certainly had a few experiences in my past that, um, that taught me that life is unpredictable, that there's nobody there for me, and that I'm, I have to be hyper responsible. But what in your life uh, what, what were the messages or experiences that particularly had a, a sensitization experience for you? And do you recognize any triggers in your current environment? Is there anything in your current environment that kind of is triggering these responses right now? And how could you improve your resilience? How could you help yourself to bounce back a little easier and stop going from, you know, this extreme states of uh, fight and flight down into freeze. So there's there's just some thoughts that I had um, in terms of discussion points, and I will um, I'll copy that so that I can put that in the chat in case you've forgotten by the time we get to it. 